sleep apnea you mentioned, yeah. and that's another one that I wanted to talk about. I've known a lot of people, it seems, that have had sleep apnea. I wonder how, you can tell me how common that is as well, but um, first I kind of wanted to ask you, like, what are some of the non-obvious presentations yeah. that, you know, of sleep apnea that you see, yeah. especially in people who, like, maybe don't even report feeling sleepy? Right. So, so the thing with sleep apnea is, the first thing to know about sleep apnea is it is shockingly common. It is very, very, very common. Um, the most recent data I've seen estimates that about one out of four or five men over 30 probably has at least some sleep-related breathing issues, especially if, if their BMI is over 30, it's more like 50-50. Um, it's really high. Women get it less often, but it's also shockingly common in women too. It might be more like one out of every 15 or 20 women. Um, and then as, as BMI goes up, it gets more common. Um, so it's, it's shockingly common. It's so common that my threshold for screening for it is very low, especially among otherwise fit people, because the normal risk factors. So like, as you gain weight, it, 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 you get it more because it can crowd out your airway. Muscle too? Yeah, muscle too. It's because, think of it this way. So most mammals, their airway is a straight line, you know, from snout all the way up and, and to, to, to their lungs. It's a straight line from the snout to their lungs. Humans, by, by moving upright, we solved a lot of problems and, and we've gotten a lot of benefit from being upright, but we cr it created, it created a problem with us in that our tube now has a 90 degree angle in it. And if you're designing a pipe and you put a 90 degree angle kink in your hose, where is it, where is it going to start having problems? It's going to have problems at that. And that's what happens. So like right around that spot here, that's where we get narrowing of the airway. And so like any mass, whether it's muscle or fat or whatever, any mass, I mean, there are people who look at MRIs of like tongue fat, like, like cheeks, like anything here that whether even skinnier people with smaller airways, you know, where it's a little more compressed, it just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a vulnerability in, in the human physiology for breathing issues. And it, there, it's actually mostly fine in that you can have four or five breathing pauses per hour in the night and be in the normal range. It's actually sleep apnea doesn't begin at five is mild begins the low end of mild. And it's not even until you get to 15 per hour that it becomes start becoming moderate. So many people who are in the mild range don't even have any symptoms and might not be causing any problems. And we have a lot of flexibility in the system, but as you get older and neuromuscular control changes, as we put on more pressure here in the airway by gaining weight or whatever, it just becomes more and more common. And my guess is it's actually been common through history. It's just, we've written it off as something else, especially in people that don't have those obvious signs. So what are some of those less than obvious signs? If I have a patient who comes in I, and they say, I fall asleep just fine. Actually, if I'm anything, I'm a little tired during the day, whatever. I fall asleep just fine, but then I wake up in the middle of the night because of stress. My stress wakes me up and then I have a hard time falling back asleep. When I hear that, I think there's greater than 50, 50 chance in my mind that that was a respiratory event. Stress doesn't wake you up. What happens is if you wake up and you're thinking I'm stressed, your brain is reading signals like elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate, um, endor the, the, the endorphins of the muscles getting tense. It's reading these physical signs. And then because we live in the society we live in, stress is readily available. We can fill that space really fast. But what, what was happening was it wasn't the stress that woke you up. It was that, you know, your breathing was starting to get a little bit constrained. So then what happens is your airway tries to open itself up and it was trying and it wasn't, it wasn't successful. So it tried harder, still wasn't successful tries a little harder, still not successful. Worst case, you wake yourself up and you, and you can, you could wake up with a gas because you can breathe when you're awake just fine. It's a different 
neuromuscular control system. So as soon as you wake up, you sort of get that, that sudden awakening because you just got that little sort of a shot of adrenaline to wake you up. And like, if I just shot you up with a little bit of adrenaline during the night, you'd wake up and you would not be able to fall back asleep. Your mind would start racing and you'd have all these physical signs, but it wasn't the stress that woke you up. The stress got superimposed on it later. So when I have a patient who comes in and describes that sensation of, I wake up in the middle of the night, either because of stress or for no reason. I don't know why something wakes me up. I have no idea, but I cannot get right back to sleep immediately. Like within a few minutes. I mean, something just happened. Some flare up just happened somewhere. I wonder if anyone's, or maybe you can tell me if anyone's ever looked at, you know, because you mentioned deep sleep is really important for this, you know, cleaning out yep. the, the toxic waste. These are aggregate protein aggregates, yes. amyloid beta 42 yep. being one. Yep. I wonder if anyone's ever looked at like people with Alzheimer's disease to see if any of them have sleep apnea, yep. like the untreated sleep apnea. Oh yeah, is untreated cool. sleep apnea is a known risk factor for neurodegeneration especially when it's more severe. So this is the thing, mild to moderate sleep apnea is a, is a gray area. Severe sleep apnea seems very, and that's 30 events or more an hour, seems very reliably tied to bad outcomes. Mild seems like it's really only tied to bad outcomes when you also have daytime symptoms. Like you're, you're mostly treating like the fatigue and the memory issues, whatever. You can still get, um, cell death and you can get neuronal problems because you're think of it this way every time you have one of these respiratory events and you're having it you know maybe dozens of times per hour in the night your oxygen drops and it's not the hypoxia that's the problem this is what a lot of people get wrong about sleep apnea it's not really the hypoxia it's the intermittent hypoxia so you're not hypoxic because what will happen is you drop a few points most people, unless you have some other lungs, most people with sleep apnea, their O2 doesn't drop a lot for sustained amounts of time, unless you have like emphysema or something. It'll drop a few percentage points, then your body wakes up and then it recovers. Then it drops again. Then your body wakes up and it recovers and it drops. Again. So it's like, it's constantly putting out all these little fires all over the place. The fires are never burning any houses down. They're just sprouting up all over the place. But what ends up happening is, all of these cells are rele releasing reactive oxygen species every time this happens. So you're releasing these reactive oxygen species, this oxidative stress is happening, and then it's quelled, and then it's stressed, and then it's quelled, and then it's stressed, and then it's quelled, and it's stressed, then it's quelled, all night, for days, or months, or years, or decades, usually. Imagine the stress, like your cells are trying to do their job, and they're constantly dealing with all this nonsense. Instead, imagine trying to do your job and you're constantly having to do all this other stuff. So you're not getting the recovery function that you're trying that that you were built for. And so your trajectory goes slightly off. So that's why sleep problem, not just sleep deprivation, but also sleep untreated sleep apnea can lead to liver problems, kidney problems, brain problems, heart issues you know, immune system problems because all of the, every cell that relies on oxygen starts getting stressed and some of them are more sensitive than others. Okay. Well, let's talk about treating, you know, sleep apnea. Yeah. I know we can talk about CPAP and what that is, and it certainly works. Yeah. Um, it's a blunt instrument. It works. Long-term adherence, maybe not so great. Uh, what do you find to be some of the best evidence-based non-CPAP yeah. interventions? Yeah. So the thing about CPAP is it's a blunt instrument because it's, it's think of it. It's just, it's just a split that keeps open your airway. It's, it's, it creates a pillow of air that, so if your airway wants to collapse, it can't. And, and CPAP, it's continuous, positive airway pressure, continuous because it's bl blowing continuously, positive airway pressure, as opposed to negative pressure, which is sucking positive airway pressure is blowing. So it's just continuously blowing air in your airway to create a pillow of air to keep it open. That's all it is. It's a blunt instrument. If your airway wants to close, you, you, you blow enough air in there, it won't be able to close. But for some people, it's too uncomfortable or whatever. So there's other approaches. The one I tend to use the most, especially with athletes who are often presenting with more mild to moderate sleep apnea anyway, are what are called mandibular advancement devices. What these are, it's essentially a retainer you wear at night mandibular, like your mandible advancement. So essentially it's a retainer that pushes your jaw forward. And in a nutshell, that's all it is. There's 
obviously a science behind it, but what it does is it creates a little muscle tone here, even when you don't want, well, even when you're trying to rest. So usually that's not a good thing, but it creates just not enough muscle tone to keep you awake, but enough muscle tone to keep this part of your airway open a little more than it normally would be. And for a lot of people with especially more mild sleep related breathing issues, does the trick. That's, that's all it takes to knock out at least enough of those events so that you don't end up noticing it anymore. And you don't have to plug it in. You don't have to switch out your hose every couple months. Like it's a little easier. You do have to get it adjusted. And as your jaw remodels, you might have to do some adjustments. You do it with a, there's a whole field called sleep dentistry. Mm. It's sleep medicine dentistry, not sedation dentistry, but sleep dentistry where it's about people diagnosing and treating sleep apnea with these dental devices. That's a very common one. Um, there's a, there's, there's also um, musculo, uh, myofacial therapy. So like you can use the musculoskeletal system and essentially exercise these muscles so that they just carry more muscle tone. That can work. I mean, there's, there's very famous work done with like people who play the didgeridoo where they have to do the cyclical breathing. It ends up strengthening certain muscles that even when you're asleep, they're a little stronger and they can maintain a little more tone. So sometimes that can help especially for more mild apnea cases. Um, there's a device um, called uh, Excite OSA uh, where, where it's, you put it on your tongue when you're awake and it sort of electrically stimulates your tongue muscle. So then you go to bed, it keeps a little, it's like a TENS unit kind of where, like, where it stimulates your tongue muscle so that when you go to bed, there's a little more muscle tone in there. That seems to work okay. Um, there's a new device. People have maybe seen commercials called Inspire, which just means breathe in. But um, it's it's sort of like a pacemaker that they install. So it's an implantable electrical device that they do surgery. But it's a sort of a pacemaker for your tongue muscle. And so what it does is when it detects that your tongue is falling back, it zaps it to open it up. And that also for people for whom it's a candidate for it, that can also, it's, you don't have to, again, there's no equipment to replace, but you do need surgery for it. And, and there's complications there sometimes, but it seems to work. Okay. Um, there's more options now than ever. And the technology is always getting better. Even with CPAP, there's more than 200 different kinds of masks out there. So for people who don't like their device and don't like their mask, cause it's uncomfortable or whatever. It's rare that I find a mask problem that can't be fixed. If, if what you need is one of those. What about, um, ma mouth taping, mouth taping. So, all right, mouth taping. So mouth taping for decades in the sleep medicine field, we've been using chin straps, it's just like a elastic band closed at night for people who are snoring that don't, that where it's just mild snoring and they don't have sleep apnea um, or their sleep apnea is mild or their sleep apnea is due to them opening their mouth at night and their tongue falling back and they can breathe through their nose. Okay. Chin straps have been great. They're they're they, They've been again used for decades. Mouth taping, I think is just sort of the same thing where you're essentially just keeping your mouth closed. You're just keeping your mouth closed in a way that you can breathe through. Like it's, it's special tape where air flows through fine. If the problem is that you're opening your mouth, I have no problem with it. And it probably, it may help those people. But if the problem is that you actually have sleep apnea and if you don't open your mouth then you can't breathe, like, and you're opening your mouth to gasp for air, then that's probably not what you want. It's probably the opposite of what you want. If, if you need to open your mouth to breathe or else you're going to have your, your oxygen is going to plummet. Don't do that. <laughs> But if for like more mild storing cases or for people who are, it's mild enough, or if it helps you keep, like maybe you're using a nasal device or, or like, a, or like strips or, or, um, Rhino Med makes these, these nasal splints where you can keep your nose open. Like if you're using one of those and you just need to keep your mouth closed, I, I have no real problem with it. I just don't think it's going to like cure cancer and save the world. But I, I feel like it's, it gets overblown by people. Sometimes. Yeah. It's gotten overblown and it sounds more like maybe for snoring yeah. than anything. Like, it and and it's, 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 if you need, if keeping your mouth closed during the night solves your problem, go ahead. But if that's, but if you're hoping that keeping your mouth closed during the night will solve your problem and it doesn't, there are other options for you.